Well, good morning. Thank you so much for joining the live stream of Living Grace Evangelical Church. Uh, wherever you are and whatever time you're watching this, whether it's right now with us on Sunday mornings or whether it's later on during the week or at another time, we're just so happy that you've joined us this morning for worship. <laughs>
hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of His wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these evictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me loves us so, oh, how He loves us, how He loves us so. for me Loves like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of His wind and mercy And all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how We're digging into the book of Genesis in our new series, and we're just talking about and looking at the lessons that are taught in the book of Genesis and how they have a foundational impact on our faith 
and they have application and implication for our everyday life. And so today we're going to be digging into a topic that I think will be pretty relative to each and every one of us. It's the topic of work. And so, you know, I remember what, what, you know, when I was growing up, I remember it being said to me, you know, about work that it's, it's just, you know, it's just a fact of life, right? It's just a fact of life. Maybe you've heard that said, or maybe that's been said to you, whether, you know, it, it's a job or a career uh, at a business place of work, or whether it's a family business or the job of being a full-time caregiver, uh, work certainly is a fact of life. It's a part of life. It's, it's intrinsic to what it means to be human. And, and, you know, we've all probably done jobs that we really didn't enjoy. Maybe we've had bosses that were really hard to work for or people that always seemed to nag and complain they were negative about their job. And, and I remember talking to somebody one time and they were just constantly complaining about their work and about their job and talking about how much they, they hated what they did. And I just remember one time I just got so fed up with hearing about it. I just said, you know, why don't you just quit? Find another job. You obviously hate this one. And their response to me, I think, was pretty telling because I, I think it it, it 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 kind of speaks to maybe where the vast majority of people land on this topic. You know, they just said, well, I can't quit. The money's too good. You know, in other words, I work to pay my bills. I, I don't need to enjoy my work. Maybe you have bought into that idea about work. But we need to understand God's perspective on work and, and how that can radically change where we're at. And, and it can radically change the way that we see our work and the higher purpose it serves than just something to be endured or a drudgery to just, you know, mull and walk our way through. So today, what I want to do is I want to dig into Genesis chapter 2, particularly starting in verse 4, going through 15, you know, which really is a section of scripture I think in ties uh, together two important concepts, the creation of human beings and the creation of work. And it's interesting that God really kind of, he ties these together and it's pretty apparent uh, from the, the earliest appearance in the Bible of this, this tying together. It seems to suggest that work, it's a part of what it means to be human. And so we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 15. And I'm just going to read it all up front here in the beginning. And we're going to kind of take some observations from it and then seek to apply it to our lives today. So starting in verse 4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the, the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in, la in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not created it or to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of, d of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havelia where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. They, the name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. So we're going to stop there. But I think that there's some key observations that we can make and we can really take out of this text about work. And the first thing that I think that's really stands out from this text as I've been digging into it and just thinking about it and, and, and mulling it over really is that what stood out to me is God's purposeful and intentional creation of man in the garden. Maybe, maybe you saw that, maybe you picked up on that as we were reading. You know, the God formed man out of the dust and he, and he, he, he in purposely and intentionally created man and he purposely and intentionally created the garden that was in Eden. Now, what's interesting in this chapter, when we're looking at this chapter, chapter two and chapter three, these are the, the only two chapters in the book of Genesis 
where the unique name given to God is Lord God, where that occurs. And it really, this unique name, it's kind of a, a, a mashing of two names for God in Hebrew. One we looked at last week, Elohim, right? Which is that uh, d- depicted power and majesty, right? The, the, the creator God. And then the other word that's mashed together here to create the word Lord God is Jehovah, which we understand as the intimate covenant-making relational God that you know we see in, in the Bible that the, the Israelites understood. Now, so it's interesting that these are the only two chapters that that name, the Lord God, appears. And I think it's pretty intentional because, because you know, we, we understand that Moses was who wrote this book according to tradition. And so Moses is pointing back to creation. He's saying, this same God who created the heavens and earth, everything, spoke everything into existence, Elohim, right? The, the, the depicting power and majesty, this creator God is the same God now who is creating man and created this garden. And he's, he's not just this distant, powerful being, but he is Jehovah. He is personal. He is relational. And so it's interesting that we see this combination of, of the names of God being made here in these two chapters in Genesis. And it's that more focused account. Some people believe that this account is, is a second creation, but that's nonsense. Uh, this is just a more focused account of the sixth day of creation where God created man and he created humanity. Now we see here that he creates man out of the dust of, of the earth. He breathes into him the breath of life. Uh, you know, it's interesting. In chapter one, we see God speaking things into existence. Let there be light. Let there be, you know, and he's speaking things into existence. But here, he's not speaking things into existence. It's personal. It's intentional. God kneels down almost, the imagery here, kneeling down into the dust and forming man in the dust and then breathing into his mouth the breath of life. And so there's, there's that personal, intentional creation of man. He doesn't just speak him into existence. The same is with the garden. In verse eight, in the garden, it says the Lord God planted a garden in Eden. He didn't say, let there be a garden that just springs up in, in Eden, right? He didn't say that. It was, he planted a garden in Eden. Again, this personal, intentional creation that we see going on here. So that's our first observation, God's personal intentional creation of man and the garden. The second observation that we see here is the high calling and purpose of the work that God gave to man, right? This high calling and purpose to the work that God gives. And And it's interesting here in verse 15, it says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it, right? So the man who, who God formed personally and intentionally, right, out of the dust, breathing life into. There's that personal intentional, the Lord God, Elohim Jehovah, right, who's, who's creating. And then he plants a garden, he makes a garden, and he puts the man that he created to tend, to work, and to keep the garden, right? There's high just intentionality and high calling and high purpose in the work that God gives, now, a little bit about the, the location of Eden. There's been some discussion about that and some questions of where was the Garden of Eden at? And there's been people who have hypothesized that, well, it was here or it was, it was in this part of Mesopotamia or no, this part of Mesopotamia. And, and the reality is, is of the four rivers that we, we, we hear about here in chapter two, we only know two to exist right now. And so the reality is, is it's anyone's guess. It could have been in Mesopotamia somewhere. Uh, we don't really quite know. It's, you know, the inability to place it in, in geography has led even some scholars to say that the Garden of Eden was maybe an extension of heaven where the life-giving waters flowed out of, out of Eden into the garden. It says in the garden, they split in the four rivers. It's just a side note there, but kind of interesting. If you think about it, in Revelation, when we go to the end of the Bible, it talks about the throne of God, and from the throne of God that the water, a water, a stream, a river flowed from the throne of God that gave life, right? And so it's kind of an interesting imagery, something to think about. Now, the word Eden, it means delight. And that description of Eden has led many scholars to believe that it was a, a point in a place where, where God dwelt. And it's kind of interesting because it, it correlates to the idea of sanctuary and kind of function maybe even as sort of a, a prototype of the tabernacle or the temple. 
And it's interesting that the work that God gives to Adam, that he gives to the man, right? The work that he gives to work and keep the garden that God planted, that correlates to really roles that the priests, you know, were serving and keeping in the temple. And so it's interesting that the work that God gave to, to mankind, it wasn't frivolous or meaningless. It wasn't, you know, just, just to be busy, uh, but it was work with high meaning, high purpose, high calling. Now, that high purpose and high meaning and calling in, in the existence of human beings and their work, that differed vastly from the other you know, mythologies around, you know, in ancient times where these surrounding mythologies of other civilizations, uh, they saw man as being created to do the, the bothersome tasks that the other gods didn't want to do, right? And in some of the, the ancient, you know, mythologies that surrounded uh, the people of Israel, the, the civilizations that surrounded that were current with the time of this, uh, man was just kind of a, uh, an afterthought of creation. It was like, oh, you know, the lesser gods got tired of doing all of the work and providing for the greater gods. And so they kind of revolted. And so man was created to, to do the bothersome tasks that they didn't want to do. And so there was not a high calling, a high purpose. It was just kind of, oh, there, you know, man was created to be slaves to the gods, basically. But we don't see that here. It's starkly different in Genesis where man is created in the image of God, right? And, and he's given this high purpose and, and high calling of working and keeping the garden. So what, why don't we experience that today, right? What, what, what's the difference? Because obviously that's not the case today, right? Uh, surely there are those who would say that they love their job. They love the work that they do. Uh, but I don't know if most people would view their job as having high meaning or high purpose or high calling. You know, many might, might even treat their work as something to just be endured, something to just kind of, you know, well, it's a fact of life. I got to work. And so it's something to be endured rather than enjoyed. See, one of the consequences of humanity sinning against God was frustration and painful toil and work. We see that in Genesis chapter 3 and verses 17 through 19 where, where God you know, speaks to, to Adam and he, he says, since you've sinned, since you've done this, and it, the result was painful toil and frustration and work. Solomon certainly saw this frustration and meaningless drudgery of work that's done outside of a higher purpose. He saw this in the book of Ecclesiastes. He talks about this in chapter 2, verses 17 through 19, where he says, So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a striving after the wind. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows? Whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he will be master of all, which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. And so outside of a high meaning, high purpose, understanding of our work, of what we do, there's that frustration, there's meaningless or purposeless toil. Maybe you felt that way before in a job, right? I know that I have, you know, when I worked as a biologist, uh, I, I know that I struggled at times with wondering whether or not what I was doing was actually making a difference, right? It was actually worth it. You know, in some, in some instances, I felt like what I was doing mattered, you know, that, you know, I was, I was testing, you know, different drugs out that would, you know, help people. And so in, in one instance, I felt, man, what I'm doing, it's crucial. It matters. It makes a difference. But in others, I just felt like at times that I just, I was working for a paycheck. You know, I didn't really like what I was doing, didn't really enjoy it. And, you know, and in some ways, you know, I felt like this was just a normal thing of life, right? Working to pay the bills, provide for the family, you know, kind of like the, the, the old saying, you don't, have to, you don't have to like what you do, you just got to do your best, right? And so I kind of just thought that's what you had to do in life. And maybe that's where you've been. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're currently there right now. Uh, you've been working at a job because, you know, you just need to pay the bills. Maybe the idea that you're to enjoy your work uh, and that it matters, maybe that's kind of a pie in the sky kind of, I wish I could do a job like that, but I can't, you know, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't work or I can't because of physical limitations or I'm just this kind of a person. I just work this kind of a job. 
Maybe that's where you feel. Maybe you feel like your work goes unnoticed, unappreciated, and you just, maybe you feel like giving up. The reality is, and what I think we learn from this as it applies to our lives, how, how, can, how can we move forward and, and recapture this understanding of work that we see in Genesis chapter one of high meaning, high purpose, high value, high calling? How can we recapture that? Well, the great news is, is that I think it can be recaptured. And so the thing that I want us to understand is the first thing is that God wants you to enjoy what you do. He wants you to enjoy your work. God created man to work and care for the garden he planted, right? I mean, think about that. God plants a garden and he says, hey, I want you to, to, to care and keep this. There's high calling, high purpose, high meaning. And I think that that's the foundational aspect of the work that he gave. Work was a positive thing, not something to, to, to begrudge or something to just endure in life. Work was positive. It was part of God's purpose for human beings as his representatives on earth, the crown of his creation. Now, although sin has distorted that and and, and frustrated and, and caused work to be painful toil, God still desires for your work to matter and for you to find enjoyment in it. You know, I, I can't help but what Solomon understood after he was frustrated and he, he, he talked about the, the meaningless toil and how it was vanity, right? In chapter 5 of, of Ecclesiastes, verses 17 and 19, he says, Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice and toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with the joy in his heart. God wants you to find enjoyment in your life, in your work. Solomon understood this. He saw this. He saw that when a person was happy with their work, that it was a gift from God. Maybe you've heard the saying, you know, find a job that you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I think that that's kind of what Solomon is saying here, that, that when we find that higher purpose, that higher, you know, calling of what, you know, our, that redeems our work, right? That brings it back and recaptures what we lost in, in Genesis chapter two, that when we recapture that, when we find that, that, it, that it, it changes our perspective and that, that we're able to, to enjoy our work, that we find something we love and we feel like we never work a day in our life. Now, th- does that mean that your work is not going to be frustrating or hard or difficult? No, we're still going to have ups and downs in our jobs. I mean, you know, I, I feel like I still have ups and downs in my job. Many people maybe even look at ministry and say, oh man, if I was in ministry, then I would really be serving, you know, the Lord. And it, 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 you know, I wouldn't feel like I was working, but the reality is, is no, there's frustration there. <laughs> there's stuff you got to deal with. It's not easy. And so the reality is, is it's not going to be easy. There's still going to be difficulty and frustration, but God's gift to us is to enjoy our work. God doesn't want you to enjoy, God wants you to enjoy what you do, uh, whether it's in that difficult job that's not very rewarding. God wants you to, to, to love what you do in a job that doesn't pay the best. God wants you to love what you do in a job that seems like it never ends, where you're constantly taking care of, a, of another person. God wants you to love your job that no one really sees as meaningful or significant. God wants you to find enjoyment in your work. Now, you might be saying, okay, that, that sounds great, again, but where does rubber meet the road here? How do I get there? Do I just, you know will it to happen and it just happens? Well, I think the good news that we see and the second good news that we see is is found in Colossians chapter three because what we see there is that Jesus, he redeems our work and he gives it a higher purpose. Jesus redeems our work and gives it a higher purpose. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as if working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So whatever you do, right, and anything that you do, Jesus redeems that for a higher purpose and meaning when we see ourselves working for him and for his kingdom. Believers are told to work at it with all their heart. And, and what, I, what I take that to mean is to work with excellence. Now, 
The caveat here is this, is excellence does not mean perfection. Excellence does not mean perfection, but it does mean giving the most energy, giving the most time, being committed to the work that you're doing. That's working with excellency. And when we see our work as being for the Lord, it, it causes a, a perspective switch. You know, maybe you've heard the phrase, bloom where you're planted, right? That's a, a, prop, a popular phrase that I've heard time and time again in different scenarios, bloom where you're planted. And the reality is, is that we can truly bloom wherever we are planted in whatever situation we find ourselves in, whether, whether we're working now, whether we're retired, whether we're taking care of people full time, whatever that may look like. You can bloom where you're planted when you recognize that what you are doing, the work you're doing, the, 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 the you know, commitment that you're doing is redeemed from that frustrating, painful toil in that which is full of meaning and purpose that is that higher calling that's higher than myself. I want to go back and rewind a little bit to my job as a biologist. You know, I didn't like it. Um, I, you know, I didn't really, I struggled with whether I, I, I found meaning in it. I, I just, I didn't enjoy it. And I remember I just, you know, I, I, I had a choice, right? I, I could do like many people do, and they just put their not, nose to the grindstone and they just work for the paycheck, right? I just, I'll put my nose to the grindstone. I'll just do this. I'll work for the paycheck. I don't have to like what I do. I just need to do it well. I could have done that. But God really challenged me, challenged my perspective, and even changed it a little bit to help me to see that there was a great kingdom potential where I was working because I worked with a lot of people who proclaimed to be atheist and agnostic. And there are many times where I had really deep theological conversations with people who were genuinely searching, genuinely asking questions. I had a chance to live out my Christian life and, and, and my convictions and, and some of it wasn't popular. Some of it, you know, people kind of bucked against, they didn't like me. But the reality is, was is that I got to live out my faith and I got to have wonderful conversations and, and I got to see some fruit from that time, that season where God had me planted, where I bloomed where I was planted. You know, Martin Luther, the great theologian and reformer, he talked about our work being a divine offering, our work being a divine offering to the Lord. And, and that happens when we realize the redeemed and higher purpose our work is in serving Jesus. So the big idea that I want you to walk away with today that I want us to encapsulate, to think about, to chew on is no matter what my work is, I can bring honor and glory to God when I view my work as a service to Jesus rather than my boss, rather than myself, rather than my family, right? The big idea, no matter what my work is, I can bring honor and glory to God when I view my work as a service to Jesus rather than my boss or myself. So in conclusion, you might say, Tyler, you know, that's all well and good, but you know, if you only knew my boss or if you only knew the job that I did or if you only knew the time and effort that I put into doing things and I, the time and effort that I expend in doing what I do, if you only knew the physical and emotional and intellectual limitations that I have, you know, how can God use my work? Or if you, my, my station in life, my situation, maybe, maybe you feel like, well, you know, I, I, I don't really do a job right now. I don't, how can I be of use? How can my work be of use to the kingdom? And the great news about the, the kingdom of God is we never retire from the work that we do in the kingdom of God, right? We can retire from our earthly jobs, but we don't ever retire from serving the Lord in the church and serving the Lord in the community, Right? And so no matter what my work is, as a follower of Jesus, that's, it's redeemed. That redeemed perspective that we see back in Genesis 2, the original intent of work, it's available to you. And I think it starts with a conscious choice to say, I'm going to bloom where I'm planted. God has planted me here for a reason, and I'm going to bloom where I'm planted. I'm going to ask the Lord to show me what it is that I need to be doing here in this time, in this season in my life to make your workplace, maybe even a mission field in partnering with God in the work of the kingdom. And so I don't know where you're falling at that. Maybe you're saying, you know what? I didn't even know that, you know, God had a plan for my life, that God even cared. I didn't know that God was a relational God that we see here in Genesis chapter two. And the reality is, is that God created you to be with him, but sin has distorted that. 
And to get back in relationship with, with, with God and to the original intent, it's as easy as A, B, C. A, we have to admit sin. The Bible tells us we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. B, we have to believe that Jesus died for our sin. We can't work our way back to God by doing good works to try to outdo all the bad that we've done. That's never going to work. It's just going to lead to frustration and toil, right? But the reality is, is that it's by grace through faith that we are saved. It's only by Christ's shed blood on the cross that our sins can be forgiven, that we could be brought back into relationship with God. And then see, we have to call on Jesus for salvation, commit to following him. And the Bible tells us that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a promise we can take to the bank. Maybe you're saying, you know what, Tyler, I, I, I never knew that. I, I, I want that for my life. Well, I want to encourage you to pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. Lord Jesus, please come into my life and save me. Help me to live for you. And Lord, I pray for each and every one of us in the, the work, the, the stuff that you have for us to do in, in, in our lives, the, the, the work, the, um, the, the, the toil, the whatever it is that we're doing, that role, the, the, the energy that we expend, whether it be taking care of somebody, whether it be in a job, whether it be whatever, Lord. God, I, help, I, just, I pray that you would help us to understand your perspective on work. Lord, help us to work for you, not for man. And Lord, help us to work for that higher purpose, for the kingdom and for your glory. I pray that you'd help us to do that. Help us to switch our perspective. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Please stick around and join us uh, briefly after this live stream as we'll be, we'll be doing a Facebook Live where we, we want to hear your prayer requests and things that are going on. want to do a, a slight recap of what we've just talked about with some challenge points and also just some quick announcements. And so we'd love to have you join and, you know, we'd love to be able to pray for your needs. So please, please stick around and join us for our, our Facebook Live shortly after this live stream.